I want to tell you a story today about a friend of mine that I met a long, long time ago. His name is John. John, um, when I first met him, it was obvious that he was intelligent, he was um, confident, and he was successful. The thing that was not obvious to me when I first met John was that he was an alcoholic. I just, that wasn't my image of what an alcoholic would be. He was not my image of what an alcoholic is. And the only reason I knew he was an alcoholic was because he told me he was an alcoholic. And he told me, one of the first times I met him, one of the things he said to me, he said, had it not, had I not kind of found the road to redemption, my life would have been destroyed. In spite of all the gifts and the graces that he had, his life would have been destroyed had he not found the road to redemption, the way he kind of described it to me. Now, you might be thinking, well, obviously, the road to redemption was Jesus, right? And the answer is yes. John is a Christian. But what I want to tell you is about the road that brought him to Jesus. Because, he, you see, when I first met John, he had been sober for many, many years. But he, even to that, I assume he's still doing it today, he every, even though he had been sober for many, many years, he still to that day had went, went to AA meetings once or twice a week, every week ever since then. Because once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic, right? But he also went because he was kind of an AA evangelist. Meaning, he believed that, that Alcoholics Anonymous is one of the greatest redemptive movements of God's Holy Spirit the world has ever known. Now, I wasn't quite as sure about that as he was when he was telling me about it. But he said, that's why he said, now, I want you to go to an AA meeting with me. And I said, sure. So I went to an AA meeting with, with my friend John, and I'm glad I did because it it inspired me to look deeper and to understand this, this movement, Alcoholics Anonymous. You know what I discovered? I discovered that the basic principles, most of the basic principles of AA um, come directly from the Bible, don't they? We've been talking here at Prairie Bible Church for the last uh, several weeks about a... Um, a discipleship toolbox, right? For those of you who've been around, you remember that. Discipleship, we know that God has equipped us with a discipleship toolbox that um, comes directly from the Bible that is, that is intended to help us grow to become more like Jesus. Well, what I discovered was that the basic principles of the Alcoholics Anonymous movement um, was a discipleship toolbox in and of itself. And what I want to do this morning is I want to share with you one of the tools that come from Alcoholics Anonymous Discipleship Toolbox. The tool that I'm going to share with you today um, that will help you if you decide to use it, the tool that I want to share with you today uh, is known by a lot of different names. Some of you may use this tool, it may be, some of you may refer to this tool as a prayer partner. Some of you may refer to this tool uh, as a, an accountability partner. In the AA movement, they refer to this tool as a sponsor. But regardless of whether you are an alcoholic or not, this tool, this biblical tool that I want to share with you today, is one that will help you to become more like Jesus. If that's your goal, this is a tool that will help you to grow to become more like Jesus. And if you're a Christian, it should be your goal. So, where do we begin? Well, our scripture lesson today, uh, Paige read it for us from the Old Testament book of Proverbs. As you've been, uh, if you've been around here long enough, you know, you've heard me describe, give you a little history of the Old Testament book of Proverbs, right? We know that the Old Testament book of Proverbs was primarily written by King Solomon, right? And the Bible tells us that he was the wisest man to have ever lived. And it's the only book in the Bible where you can literally take one verse or one passage and uh, it, it can stand on its own. The book of Proverbs is filled with pithy, it's a very, you need to be very careful when you use that word, don't you, Randy? Statements, statements that are, are um, wise, 
um, direct and to the point. And they stand all by themselves. You don't need to know necessarily what goes on ahead of it or what goes on after it. You don't necessarily need to know context or history to get the wisdom from the, the book of Proverbs. But the particular um, proverb that Paige shared with you today, I think, deserves a little history and context. So if you're willing to bear with me for a moment, um, come with me on a journey. If you have your Bibles, if you don't have your Bibles, take out, take out your phone if you can do this quickly with me. Um, the place we're going to begin and give you some history and context for our passage from Proverbs today is in the Old Testament book of 2 Chronicles chapter 12. Now, the story in, Old, in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 12 is one that you may uh, remember if, you've, if you're a Bible scholar. It's kind of an interesting story. It's a story of King Solomon's father, who is who? Who's King David? That's right. King Solomon's father was David. And the Bible tells us that, that David was known as a man after God's own heart. Remember that? We know that David is kind of one of those saints of the Bible, right? We know that he was known after, as, a God, as a man after God's own heart. He loved God. He was a godly man. But what you need to understand is that even godly people mess up sometimes. Because we are all, right? And even the saints in the Bible messed up sometimes. That's one of the things I love about the Bible is that God doesn't sugarcoat things for us. He, when, he, when, when we hear about people from the Bible, most of the time you get to see everything that they are, warts and all. I love that. And one of the things that, if you look at King David in 2 uh, Chronicles chapter 12, is that King David was a, hum, a messed up human being just like you and me. He was a sinner. But because he and God were so tight, God loved him enough to bring someone into his life to hold him accountable when he sinned. And this someone, this is what is found in 2 Chronicles chapter 12. It's the story of the man that God brought into King David's life to hold him accountable. His name was the prophet Nathan. God brought Nathan into David's life to hold him accountable, to call him back to the path of righteousness, the path of God. Not an easy thing to do, a scary thing to do actually, to hold the most powerful man in the world accountable. But he did it because God asked him and because he loved David. Okay, put a pin in that right there. Now I want you we're to, to direct you to the Old Testament book of 1 Kings chapter 4. If you have ever read, first, some of you have read through the Bible multiple times. I can almost guarantee you, if you have read through the Bible multiple times, none of you remember what is in 1 Kings chapter 4. It is one of the most boring chapters in the entire Bible. Especially the first part. 1 Kings chapter 4 what you will find is just a bunch of names of people, some of the funniest names of people you've ever heard. And basically what 1 Kings chapter 4, the first part, is doing for us is, is kind of filling out for us King's court. These are the people that King Solomon surrounded him, himself with. And one of the people that King Solomon surrounded himself with in verse 5 was a dude called, I did that for you, Randy. Dude it was a dude called Zabad. How many of you can re ever, ever remember reading about a guy named Zabad in the Bible? Keith, you ever heard of him? There's very little reason why you'd want to hear about any of these people, but as you go a little deeper, you'll find something out about Zabad. In verse 5, you can discover that, that Zabad was a priest. In verse 5, you'll also uh, discover that he was a friend and an advisor to Solomon. But if you go just a little bit further, you'll discover that not only was he a priest, and not, not only was he the friend and advisor to King Solomon, but he was the son of Nathan. 
the same Nathan who had held King Solomon's father, David, accountable many, many years before. And now, Zabed was a friend and advisor and accountability partner with Solomon. Is that a coincidence? I'll tell you why. It's, I know it's not a coincidence. Proverbs 27, 17. King Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, said this. He said, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Now, if I were to, go to um, put that in language that we have shared before, basically what, it's, what he was saying is that every single one of us needs someone in our lives who love us enough who know us well enough and are brave enough to tell us the truth. As iron sharpens iron, so one man or so one woman sharpens another. You see that? We need each other. We need somebody in our lives that love us enough to tell us the truth. We need somebody in our lives that we have given permission to, to speak the truth. Do you have anybody like that? Most people don't, you know why? Because we're chicken. King David had Nathan. Solomon had Zabud. Who do you have? Um, Alcoholics Anonymous is so sold out to this discipleship tool that everyone who comes into that movement is assigned a sponsor, an accountability partner, a prayer partner, whatever you want to call them. Every one of them is. Because they know that if, you, if they ever hope to, to live a victorious life, you've got to have someone like that in your life. And whether you are an alcoholic or an addict or not, You want to know who mine is? Sitting right there. Mr. Keith Nestor. Keith and I have known each other for um, a long time. And every week, he and I get together. We don't really have an agenda. We just talk about our lives, right? For about an hour. Talk about what's going on. And this is what I know when I meet with Keith. I know that he's brave enough, he knows me well enough, and he loves me enough to tell me the truth. And you know the same thing about me, right? And we've done a lot, haven't we? Now, I'm going to warn you something. If, if you want, if you know you need somebody like that in your life, it's going to take an investment. You can't just do it. You can't just say, oh, that sounds like fun. You're going to have to invest uh, time and energy, and you're going to have to be vulnerable. But it's worth it. It's not only worth it to know that you'll have someone that loves you enough and, and is there for you enough and is pr brave enough to tell you the truth to bring you back on God's path of righteousness, it's a wonderful thing and it's worth it because you'll know that that person will walk that path with you. So, 
If you think that's something that you want, that you need, you think, well, where do I start? How do I do this? Um, Bill was kind of teasing about his wife. Your spouse can be that person for you, but that's not really the way it's supposed to work. <laughs> Your spouse will probably do that too. Um, but sometimes it's hard to hear it from your spouse, if you haven't noticed. If you need somebody like that in your life, as you come forward this morning to receive communion, the way to start is just to ask. Ask God. Say, Jesus, I think I need someone like that. I need a prayer partner, an accountability partner, whatever you want to call it. I need someone like that in my life. It might be somebody that um, and God may raise to your consciousness or bring into your path someone that you've known for a very long time, like Keith and I, or it may be someone you've never met before. So be open. That person may end up being one of the most important persons you've ever met. So ask.